Well, it's a pleasure to be here, um, and I'm really excited about the overall focus of this conference. And actually, in line with the theme of the conference, what I'm going to be talking to you about today um, is, is this notion of times are changing. Uh, we have a diversity of interests now when it comes to wildlife management and wildlife conservation. And of course, that diversity of interests, as you've been hearing about from other speakers, creates a lot of challenges for the wildlife management profession, but it also creates a lot of opportunities. And so what I'm going to be sharing with you today is, is some of the research that we've been conducting um, that's aimed at trying to better understand the diversity of interests that are out there as a way of, of being able to plan more effectively for the future of conservation and ensure that different perspectives are represented and heard. So with that, um, I wanted to give you a little bit of background first. If I can get the projector to work here. Let's see. Maybe if I turn it on, that would help. There we go. Um, so I wanted to give you a little bit of background that, to set the stage for the research that we've been conducting. Um, first of all, if you think about um, changes that have been happening over time, few who have been involved in the wildlife profession over the years would probably deny that values toward wildlife and natural resources more broadly have changed pretty dramatically over the latter half of the 20th century in this country. And specifically, what we've seen happen is this gradual shift away from the more consumptive-oriented tradition um, in wildlife management um, and a push more towards um, looking at the way we m manage our public lands in a different way. We've also seen evidence of change if we look at this growing interest in species protection and protecting a variety of different types of species over time. We've seen legislation at the federal as well as the state levels to support this evolving interest. And in some senses, we've moved a little bit away from the traditional model of game management around which the wildlife profession has formed. And we're, we're opening up to other forms of management as we consider the wildlife profession. We've also seen evidence of change if we look at recreation trends. Um, so uh, reports like those released from the National Survey on Fishing, Hunting, and Wildlife-Associated Recreation tell us that there have been dramatic declines over time in certain forms of recreation like hunting and fishing. And at the same time, we've seen dramatic interest in, um, or dramatic increases in interest and participation in other forms of recreation like wildlife viewing. And I should mention that the most recent national survey results that came out have shown a slight rebound, actually, in hunting participation. We've seen an increase. But over time, gradually, we've seen um, the, the trend more toward declines. And that raises a lot of questions and, and poses a lot of challenges for the wildlife profession. Because on the one hand, we have state fish and wildlife agencies that are charged with wildlife conservation in the state that rely heavily upon the sale of hunting and fishing licenses to support those conservation efforts. So it raises questions about, you know, how do we secure a stable source of funding for the future? Also, we have concerns when we look at those declines in hunting and fishing about competition over a limited resource on our public lands, competition among stakeholders that have different preferences. And then also, we in some cases see concerns about the loss of a population control mechanism for wildlife. So in areas where ungulate populations are booming because of loss of natural predators, um, if we don't have hunting as an opportunity there to control some of those populations, it creates concerns. We also see a whole host of other challenges that agencies are faced with when it comes to wildlife management today. And um, part of this stems from changes that are taking place in the Western United States, changes like urbanization, population growth, land development, changes that are putting tremendous pressure on natural resources and on wildlife populations in particular. And this is leading to habitat loss, habitat fragmentation, and also to a rise in human-wildlife conflict in many areas. I'm not sure if you can see those slides very well, but I will point out in the upper left, what you're seeing there is a moose in amongst uh, anglers fishing on the Kenai River in Alaska. Okay, and, um, and then on the bottom right, you have a herd of elk in a residential area in Colorado. So these are the kinds of situations that we increasingly face with land development and urbanization and so on. <coughs> 
So I mentioned that this has contributed to a rise in human-wildlife conflict in many cases. And this slide is just pointing out the magnitude of impact when we think about human-wildlife conflict issues. So one of the challenges is wildlife depredation on crops and on livestock. And there's a researcher at Utah State University who has estimated um, that about one and a half billion dollars, or I'm sorry, 4.5 billion dollars in the U.S. is the estimated annual impact from wildlife damage to agricultural producers. So a huge challenge, obviously, and a, and a lot of loss there. Also, when we talk about human wildlife conflict, we have losses due to auto accidents involving wildlife. And the estimate there is there are about 1.5 million deer vehicle collisions per year in the United States with a loss of around $1.6 billion. And of course, that doesn't take into account the um, impacts on human lives and also on wildlife populations. Also, when we talk about human-wildlife conflict, we see this rise in nuisance incidents. Um, so for example, wildlife caused damage to landscaping in residential areas. Um, also, we in some cases have threats to human safety, either through direct harm, that might be wildlife attacks on people, um, as well as disease transmission. In the upper right hand corner of the slide here, you can see um, a deer that's suffering from chronic wasting disease, a disease that's increasingly of concern here in the United States, um, also in terms of its impacts potentially on important game species. This is another type of challenge um, that I like to depict. Um, there are a number of things going on here in this slide. Um, but what this is intended to show is that increasingly with urbanization, we find a public that's more removed from direct day-to-day -day interaction with wildlife and with natural resources. So Tony talked a little bit about it, this sort of disconnect that's happening with respect to urbanization. And in some cases, that creates a situation where people are not well educated or maybe not very aware of what constitutes appropriate behavior when it comes to interacting with wildlife. And at the same time, you have a public um, that is increasingly want to, wanting to have these more up close and personal experiences with wildlife. So it creates a bit of a dilemma. Um, and a challenge for the agencies, really. Um, because on the one hand, you want to be able to provide opportunities for people to have intimate experiences with wildlife and build a sense of stewardship. But at the same time, we don't want to be promoting situations that are going get, to get people into trouble with respect to safety concerns. This is a billboard that is actually um, you know, something that you encounter on the way to Yellowstone that's promoting a certain type of tourism opportunity that people are wanting to enjoy. So there are challenges with respect to education and communication. Another challenge um, that we see in amidst, in amidst these changes is a rise in social conflict over wildlife issues increasingly today. And this social conflict is evidenced in the rise in ballot initiatives, the growth in ballot initiatives that's happened over the years in the United States, particularly in the Western United States. So ballot initiatives that have banned practices such as trapping and certain forms of recreational hunting. You also see evidence of this social conflict if you look at um, increasing concerns about the ethical treatment of animals and, sp and people speaking out about that. Another change that I'll highlight here um, is you're increasingly seeing uh, the commercialization of wildlife and the resource. And there are positive aspects to this, but also some downsides to it. Positive aspects would be that you know, we see that, that wildlife and natural resources are able to contribute pretty effectively um, to economic development and to tourism opportunities. But on the downside, it creates some complexities in terms of how we manage the resource, realizing that there are certain demands that may not have been there before on those resources. Also in terms of changes, um, you've seen growth in non-governmental organizations and their involvement in wildlife conservation. And this creates an opportunity in the sense that you have different organizations now that are coming to the table with resources to, to want to conserve. Um, but at the same time, it also creates some challenges. There are needs for partnerships and needs to more effectively work together. And part of this also involves engaging the public and engaging different interests in conservation as well. Okay, so these are just all um, examples of the many challenges that we increasingly face in wildlife management and wildlife conservation today. 
And these are just a few of the challenges that set the stage for some of the research that we've been conducting. And this is research for the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, which is basically an organization that represents the interests of the different state agencies throughout the Western United States. And um, the research that we've been conducting is, is basically looking at some of these key questions that you see depicted here. So one of the overarching questions is why has social conflict over wildlife increased? And then more specifically, how do people think about wildlife and how do, how do different people think about wildlife differently? Realizing that those differences in thought and the changes in that are what's really at the root of a lot of the conflicts that are occurring. Does there appear to be a trend of change and why might this trend be occurring? And then perhaps most importantly, how can this information improve wildlife decisions? So we're looking at the different public interests that are out there and giving that information to agencies and working with them to, to figure out what this means for the future. I want to give you a little bit of background, um, and I don't want to make this too academic by any means and have people start to fall asleep on me in here, but I do want you to have a little bit of background so you can get a sense for um, you know, some of the concepts we built upon to be able to do this work. Ron Englehart is a political scientist who's introduced a theory of value shift, and he's done work cross-culturally, so around the world in different societies. And what Englehart has argued and been able to show in some of his findings is that industrialization and some of the processes that have followed in countries like the United States have played a primary role in producing the mix of values that are evident in today's societies. And specifically, what he argues is that values in countries like the U.S. are changing in response to shifting need states. Okay, and I'll kind of walk you through what this means, and then we'll get back to how this relates to wildlife management. But what Englehart argues is that in countries like the United States, prior to World War II, values were formed mostly around concern for economic well-being and more uh, fundamental utilitarian needs. Okay, so we're looking at what you're seeing here is Maslow's hierarchy, which some of you may be familiar with, but it's basically just a hierarchy that shows different levels of needs. And we're looking at countries here to think about how they might be changing. Okay? So prior to World War II, there was a focus at the bottom rungs of the hierarchy. Okay? And then, following World War II, what we saw happen is that there was this huge period of growth and economic development in this country. And that created a different set of life circumstances for people being brought up during that time period. And that different set of life circumstances meant that people had higher levels of income, higher levels of education, and we saw changes in values that they then showed as adults. Okay? So this is a change that's been happening intergenerationally, and it's spawned by economic development. It's not change that occurs within individuals, but across generations as the lifestyle circumstances change. Okay? So this is how he argues values have changed in countries like the US. And so following World War II, um, values for most formed more around some of these higher order needs on the hierarchy. So like belongingness, self-esteem, self-actualization, less, fo less focused on physical and economic security and things like that. And he argues that this has been associated with a loss of faith in government and also a rise in environmentalism. And the loss of faith in government idea stems from the notion that institutions that would have been formed during earlier time periods, they change slowly and they don't necessarily keep up with the changes in society. And so what you have is this disconnect then. Institutions that are around today that may have been formed many, many years ago may not necessarily reflect the values of the current generations. And you see a level of mistrust and a loss of faith in government associated with that. So here's just one snapshot of some of Englehart's findings that, that support some of these arguments. And again, I mentioned he's done work around the world in different countries. But what you see here is plotted on the x-axis at the bottom there is an indicator of wealth for countries. So we're looking at gross national product here per capita in 1950. And what's magical about 1950, the reason why he's chosen that as the, the time period, is because that's after World War II when we started to see a lot of these changes in values. And then on the y-axis, so the vertical axis, you see, um, it's a little bit confusing, but basically the higher up you go on that axis, 
the higher percentage of people in the country that have more utilitarian life values. Whereas alternatively, if you look at countries like the United States, on the far right there, they're lower on that vertical axis, so they have higher percentages of people representing more of these modern day life values that Engelhart's talking about that would focus on higher order needs. Okay? And so what he's showing here is current day values against an indicator of wealth for 1950, and he shows that countries like the U.S. that have higher levels of wealth following World War, I, World War II also have higher percentages of people with those modern life values and lower percentages of people with utilitarian life values. Does that make sense? Sort of? Okay. <laughs> All right, so bringing it back to um, the relevance for wildlife management and the research that we were conducting, the big question here is, as a reflection of broader societal shift, similar to what Engelhart's talking about, has thinking about wildlife changed from thought rooted in these utilitarian-based needs to more of a, a mutualism and belongingness-based needs framework? Okay, a little bit more background and then we'll delve into some of the results and talk about what they mean. We've introduced this concept called wildlife value orientations that's intended to capture the diverse array of values that people have toward wildlife. And basically when we talk about wildlife value orientations, we're talking about these enduring beliefs regarding wildlife and wildlife management that are reflective of our more fundamental values. And we can look at two classes or categories of thought that I've got here shown on the slide that go along with this concept. So one is ideal world or world view, and that's essentially how we want the world to be regarding wildlife. And then principles for wildlife treatment, these would be guiding principles for how we want to interact with and treat wildlife. So drawing upon that concept, we've identifi identified two main streams of thought or wildlife value orientations in the Western United States. And those, this also builds on traditions of work on wildlife values by people like Steve Kellard and others who have done work in this area. But the first main stream of thought or value orientation is utilitarian. So individuals who have a strong utilitarian orientation toward wildlife are likely to believe in an ideal world where wildlife exists primarily for human use and enjoyment and there's an abundance of wildlife for activities like hunting and fishing. And then principles for wildlife treatment that go along with this orientation are things like we should manage wildlife so that humans benefit and the needs of humans should take priority over wildlife. So individuals with a strong utilitarian view are more likely to want to participate in activities like hunting and fishing and to support those activities. And also they're more likely to um, uh, express support for some traditional forms of wildlife management, for example, lethal control. Now, alternatively, if we look at the second mainstream of thought or wildlife value orientation, it falls under this term of mutualism. And a mutualism orientation is more reflective of the belongingness needs and that change that Engelhart's been talking about in our societal values. So individuals who have a strong mutualism orientation tend to believe in an ideal world where wildlife are capable of relationships of trust with humans, almost as if they're part of an extended family. And if we look at principles for wildlife treatment that go along with this, they're going to be things like animals should have rights like humans, and we should prevent cruelty to animals. So it captures some of those ethical concerns that I talked about um, that with respect to the changes in wildlife management that are happening. Um, individuals who have a strong mutualism view are uh, more likely to oppose activities like hunting and fishing, and they're also more likely to oppose traditional forms of wildlife management. Now, I would be simplifying things or oversimplifying things if I told you that all we need to be concerned about is these two orientations, because there's a lot more diversity out there than that. Um, so if we kind of break things down a little bit more, we really start to see uh, more of that diversity, um, and, and I'll show you some findings related to that in just a moment. Um, but we can identify four different types of people on the basis of the levels of these orientations that they hold. Okay, and I'll, I'll, this will make more sense in a second as I walk you through. So intuitively, this one would make sense. Individuals who have more of a utilitarian orientation toward wildlife and score low on, on some of the mutualism scales, they're going to be utilitarians. Mutualists, if I can get this to work, um, are going to be individuals who have more of a mutualism orientation toward wildlife. Okay? But then interestingly, there's a group that, that we've identified um, and called the pluralists. And these are individuals who have both a utilitarian orientation toward wildlife and a mutualism orientation. 
And you may be asking, well, how is this possible? Because these orientations seem to be in conflict with one another. And um, the way it works, and, and what our research has suggested, is that which of the orientations plays a role in someone's thinking is going to be dependent upon the situation, or the context, or the issue. So for some situations or issues, pluralists are going to behave more like utilitarians, and for other issues, they're going to be behaving more like mutualists. And I should mention, if I had to categorize myself, I'd probably be in that pluralist category, because I'm very supportive of hunting and fishing. I'm a fisherman myself. My husband hunts, but I am not a hunter myself. So I'm kind of in the middle there with respect to those different orientations, if that makes sense. OK. Um, distanced individuals, um, these are individuals who don't have a well-formed value orientation toward wildlife. They tend to be less interested in wildlife and wildlife-related issues. And this is the group that perhaps agencies might be most concerned about because they sort of represent um, the group that Richard Louv and, and others who have, have written about um, this disconnect between children and nature, the, the group that they're concerned about. Okay, just to give you a little bit of sense for the methodology, and then we'll jump into the results now that I've given you a lot of background on these concepts. Um, the methodology we use is, is we administer a mail survey, and the first phase of this research was completed in 2005. Um, we administered the mail survey to residents in each of the 19 western states, and we had over 12,600 uh, mail surveys come back to us completed, which is a really large um, number, and, and part of that was because we not only wanted to say something about what was happening in the western region, but we also wanted to be able to give the participating state agencies information about publics in their state. So we had a large number to be able to generalize. And then I won't go into the detail on, on some of the follow-up um, testing there, um, but it kind of gives you a sense for, for the methods that we use. Okay, to measure wildlife value orientations, um, this is an approach that was developed in the early 90s, and we've refined it since that time. But basically what we do is, on the survey, have people rate their level of agreement with a series of statements that represent beliefs about wildlife and wildlife management. And so on a one to seven scale, with one being um, strongly disagreed, a seven strongly agree, we ask them things like this. So an example utilitarian statement would be the needs of humans should take priority over fish and wildlife protection. An example of a mutualism statement might be animals should have rights similar to the rights of humans. And then we look at patterns of response across the whole set of items that get included on the survey, and that gives us a sense for what people's orientations are. All right. So now I'll jump into the results. So this is looking at the western region level at the distribution of the different wildlife value orientation types. So you see it's a little over 30% classified as utilitarians and mutualists in the western region. Um, I can't see that very well over there, but I think it's about 20% pluralist and 12% distanced. And so these findings are for the western region, which means that states like California that have higher percentages of, of the population, they're going to be driving these findings to some extent. Now, 95% plus or minus like 5% error. Yeah, so we do a lot of, of you know, validation of those results. And I'd be happy to share more with you afterwards if you're interested. OK. So um, percent classified as utilitarians. Now we can start to look at what's going on in Idaho relative to other Western states. And I know you can't see the numbers very well on here, but we're looking at the geographic distribution of the different wildlife value orientation types. So for utilitarians, if you look at the darker color shading, that's going to be a higher percentage of people with that value orientation type in the state. So we see higher percentages of utilitarians in the Rocky Mountains and Plains states, lower percentages along the coast. The highest percentages were found in Alaska and South Dakota at 50%, and Idaho was just behind that at 49%. So one of the highest uh, percentages of utilitarians relative to the western region. Now if we look at percentages of mutualists, the pattern sort of reverses itself. So in states like Alaska and South Dakota, where you had high percentages of utilitarians, you now have very low percentages of mutualists relative to other states. Um, higher percentages found along uh, the coastal areas with the highest in Hawaii at, I believe, 41%. Um, Idaho is at the lower end relative to other western states, 18% uh, um, classified as mutualist. OK, so that's the geographic distribution, just telling us descriptively what's going on in, in terms of these different public interests. 
But the other big question that I raised here was this question of change. So what's happening with respect to these different orientations over time? Are we seeing this move more toward mutualism, as Engelhart might be suggesting, with value shift? So what we did um, in this investigation is at the state level, we looked at factors like urbanization, income, and education. These are all factors that are associated with modernization and some of the changes that Engelhart's talking about at the societal level. So we looked at how those factors were linked to the composition of wildlife value orientations within a state. And so similar to how Engelhart was plotting countries, we're plotting states here. So I'm showing you one graphic um, as an example. And on the x-axis, we're looking at an indicator of urbanization. And so the further right you go on there, the higher percentages of people in the state that live in urban areas. And then on the x-axis, we have the percent classified as mutualist with respect to their wildlife value orientation. And what we find here is an, uh, this um, nice sort of linear relationship where you have higher percentages of people li living in urban areas, higher percentages of people then classified as mutualist. So you see Idaho as one of the states represented on there that has lower percentages of people living in urban areas, lower percentages of mutualists. We find this same trend with income and education. And so while we don't have longitudinal data, meaning we don't have data collected over time at this point, we've just done the first phase of the research, we are showing patterns here that are consistent with what we'd expect if some of these forces are driving a shift or a move more toward uh, mutualism. Okay. What I wanted to do now, um, and I'll just go ahead and put all this text up on, on the slide, um, is just briefly talk about why some of these changes might be occurring and make it more relevant for, for wildlife management. So I'm going to take urbanization as an example and sort of walk you through why this might be affecting how people think about wildlife and how it's affecting that public thought. So with urbanization, we have a situation where you have an insulation from dependency upon natural resources. So I have undergraduates in my classes that I teach that don't even know where their food comes from, oftentimes. There's kind of this disconnect between, you know, buying food at the grocery store and realizing where it truly comes from. So there's this insulation. We also have social learning that increasingly occurs as opposed to direct experience with wildlife and natural resources. So an example of that is people are learning more about wildlife and the natural environment on programs on television like Animal Planet and National Geographic. Um, they're learning more in that way and through discussions with their peers and their school surroundings than they are in, in the outdoors and actually experiencing it firsthand. And that leads to differences in how people think. Um, also, there's less social support in some cases for utilitarian activities in urban environments. Um, you know, more um, sort of opposition to hunting in, in certain circles in urban communities. And then also utilitarian activities are going to require more effort oftentimes. So there are issues of access and needing to drive further. So you can see how all of these things would be creating then a different set of life circumstances for new generations being brought up now in urban environments. And that affects how they think about wildlife as adults. In some cases, it makes them more distanced with respect to the resource. In other cases, it makes them move more toward this sort of mutualism sentiment. All right, so again, um, kind of bringing it back to wildlife management and the meaning here. Um, this is a graph, I don't know if you can see it very well, but this is showing the percent of past hunters who are still active within a state by the percent of people classified as having a utilitarian. Actually, did I skip one? Sorry, I was on the wrong one. This is actually showing you um, levels of trust in the state fish and wildlife agency relative to the percent of mutualists in a state. So remember, I mentioned that issue of trust um, that Engelhart has talked about. There's a loss of faith in government. We can look at how that might be impacting um, people's levels of trust in state fish and wildlife agencies. So we see that in states like Idaho, where we have higher percentages of utilitarians, lower percentages of mutualists, there's a higher level of trust in the state fish and wildlife agency relative to what you see happening in other states. So states where there's the higher percentage of mutualists, less trust in the state fish and wildlife agency. Okay, now here's the one that I thought I was talking about a minute ago. Um, this is looking at the percent of past hunters who are still active by the percent of utilitarians in a state. 
And what this is an indicator of is to what extent hunters have remained active over time. So it's on the survey taking all of the people who said they had participated in hunting in the past and parsing out those who actually hunted within the last 12 months. Um, and so what you see here is that states like Idaho that have higher percentages of utilitarians have higher percentages of hunters who have remained active. You can also look at it on the reverse and say that states that have lower percentages of utilitarians have more hunter dropout. So that links to that question of declines in hunting and how that might be linked to some of these societal changes. Okay, I'm going to skip over this one for sake of time. It's basically just showing that link to um, wildlife recreation activities that I already pointed out in the previous slide. So one thing that we find happen with these, va with these wildlife value orientations is that they have an impact on how pe people think about wildlife issues. So in addition to affecting people's behavior, like whether they're going to participate in hunting and fishing, you also see a situation where it's affecting how they react to wildlife management issues. So it affects their attitudes, essentially. Um, here's one example of that. So this is looking at um, the acceptability across the different value orientation types for um, management tools for dealing with a human wildlife conflict situation. And this was measured on the survey, and this is you know, combining the results across the whole western region. But essentially the situation is bears are getting into trash and pet food containers and creating a nuisance situation in residential areas, something that we increasingly find in western states. I know we're dealing with it now in Colorado. And along the x-axis there you have different management strategies that people were asked about about. So the first one is do nothing to control bear populations in that situation. The second one is provide more recreational opportunities to hunt bears and then conduct, conduct controlled hunts using trained agency staff. And what we find is that when we're talking about doing nothing, there's relative consensus among the different value orientation types that that's unacceptable. But then we start to look at a lethal control strategy and specifically looking at recreational hunting opportunities in the middle there, and we find that there's a clear division among the types. So it's showing you how these value orientations can form the foundation for conflict over wildlife-related issues. And we see that well over 50% of utilitarians and pluralists are supportive of that strategy and well under 50% of mutualists and distanced feel that way. And there's a little more consensus if we look at that final strategy on the right there and that's conduct controlled hunts using trained agency staff. So there's a little more support for that but you see that same trend. There's that foundation of conflict. Now I'm going to give you an example that I know is, is pretty salient to many of you right now and very controversial in Idaho and the western U.S. as a whole. So we're dealing here with an issue of wolves in Idaho. Um, on the survey, um, we asked about a series of, of wolf-related issues. And here you're looking at the acceptability of reducing the number of wolves to produce more deer and elk for hunting in Idaho. And the way to read this graph is to look at the center of those bubbles plotted against that Y or vertical axis. What that's going to tell you is basically the mean or the average response on the response scale, which ranged from 1 at the bottom there, highly unacceptable, to 7, highly acceptable. And then look at the size of the bubble, too. That's basically telling you the amount of agreement or consensus among individuals in the group on that issue. So a bigger bubble, less consensus, more disagreement. Smaller bubble, a lot more consensus. So the trend here is that utilitarians, while there's a lot of division within individuals in that group, um, on average they find that to be acceptable. Pluralists, a little bit more in agreement, and yes, they find that to be acceptable as well. And then the mutualists, they're in quite a bit more agreement that that's an unacceptable strategy and distanced as well. So again, you see that foundation for conflict um, over a, a key wildlife management issue here in the state. Okay, so for sake of time, I'm not going to go into, I had a couple of examples of what I would refer to as emerging applications of this values information, and I'll just kind of sum it up by saying there are two things that we, we've been working on um, as kind of a follow-up to some of this research. Um, one is, we've been looking at trying to collect this information at finer degrees of resolution. Because the problem we run into a lot of times is that while we have the state level information or the region level information, that's helpful in telling us about the publics that are out there. 
Um, it doesn't give us a lot of information at local levels where oftentimes on the ground decisions are being made. So we've launched a new investigation that's looking at collecting this information on values and attitudes toward wildlife related issues on the ground at more local levels. So in relation to communities, in relation to counties, and so on. So that's one initiative that we've been working on. And then the other one, kind of an extension of these findings, is um, working with state fish and wildlife agencies to um, help them design more targeted programs for connecting children to nature. Um, realizing that that sort of, um, you know, children nature disconnect is something that, um, you know, many people are interested in addressing right now. And if we have wildlife values information of the target audiences, that can help us be more effective in, in the reach. Um, for those audiences and also in, in the ways in which we go about developing programs um, for people with, with different interests. Okay, so to summarize and conclude then, I mentioned that we don't have longitudinal data yet, um, but we are looking at implement, implementing another phase of this project to be able to look at changes that are happening over time and at more local levels. Um, but the evidence that we do have, and linking into some of these broader um, researchers' investigations like Engelhart's work, um, we do see that public thought regarding wildlife is seemingly changing in the western U.S., and it is part of this broader value shift. Um, it's a shift from utilitarian to mutualism, wildlife value orientations that I talked about. And the change is rooted in really big, broad things that are happening. So it's not just something that's going to happen overnight, and it's not something that we have a lot of control over. Um, this is culture shift. So this is changes in demographics, changes in economic development, changes in levels of wealth. These are the things that at the societal level are driving some of these changes. And the shift is thought to be at the root of many of the challenges that we're seeing in wildlife conservation today. So declines in hunting, a rise in social conflict over wildlife issues, all of the things that I talked to you about at the outset. So what becomes important is if we can get a better handle on the different public interests that are out there, um, and you know some of the work that we've been doing I think can help with that, but it can help us be more proactive in thinking about the future of wildlife management and wildlife conservation, realizing that, that public thinking is at the root of a lot of the things that are going on, challenges as well as opportunities. So with that, um, I will end, and I will turn it back over to Dick. Thank you. Thank you.